So let's start now. <coughs> so just learning how to be free, what is freedom? Many people, they, they imagine that we live in a free world. How true is that? Sometimes people look at monks and nuns and say, why do you have to live in such a monastery where there's so many things you can't do and you can't enjoy? And there are all these rules on what you are supposed to do, what you're not supposed to do. Isn't that just uh, restraining your sense of freedom? And of course, uh, a monk, a nun, that we can ordain if for however long we wish in our tradition, there are no things called lifetime vows. It's like almost like happiness vows, as long as you're enjoying what you're doing, you can keep on staying here. And I often tell people that when I became a monk 46 years ago, I only thought I was going to become a monk for maybe one or two years, become enlightened, and then go back to work, get married, <laughs> and carry on my job once I got that out of the way, enlightenment. But then after a while you realize there was something else which was far more deeper than you expected. The sense of like freedom. Even though there were so many things you weren't allowed to do, there was a sense of freedom around that. Many of you have had the opportunity to visit our monasteries. We're always building new ones, opening up new places of freedom. And in each one of those monasteries, you can go and stay there. And there's nothing to do, nothing going on. And there's no goals to meet. And you can see sometimes how those goals, which we set ourselves or we believe that other people set for us, take away your sense of freedom. You've got to you know, pay off the bills, you've got to uh, get more um, graduation uh, certificates or just more uh, success or whatever you wish to gain in this world, sometimes that creates so much tension and you wonder, what am I doing this all for? So many people feel like that. Why am I doing such things in order to be free sometime in the future? When you started to become a monk, when I became a monk, Again, you felt there was something about the lifestyle of simplicity, of kindness, of peace, in which the sense of freedom started to grow. You know, you were free from the burden of having to get so much things in our world to survive. Even today, I haven't said this for over a year now, I think, but you see people's houses I see people's houses because often when you get a new house, I go to your house or apartment to, to chant for it. And so I get a squiz and look into how people live in this world. And some people have huge houses. And one of the, the most luxurious houses I ever visited here in Perth on the, the riverside, a huge place. And because I just arrived from Serpentine, I think this was in Shelley somewhere. And I had to go to the toilet. There's no ordinary things. And I said, which way to the toilet? And this is no exaggeration. The owner of the house had to draw a mud map. It wasn't just over there. He had to turn left here, right there, down the corridor. It was such a huge house. <laughs> and I often tell that story. And when I came back into the room, Apparently, the big houses these days for wealthy people all come with GPS systems to navigate within the house. <laughs> but I asked the person afterwards, how many people live in your house? And it was a shock, I'll never forget this answer. She said, only me. And that just really made me so sad. That Why? Because you'd think in a big house, you know, with a very successful business lady, that she could enjoy that freedom, but she couldn't. Her house was a prison. She didn't like how the relations or friends you know, into her house, because she was afraid they'd ask for money. She was a bit sort of um, concerned about me being in there <laughs> as well. 
and monks and Buddhist societies. What funds are you raising for now? <laughs> but I'm well behaved. And so sometimes that you see the huge houses with one person or two persons in them. Why? And I just go back to the nice simplicity when I grew up. My father was very poor, sick most of his life until he died. And so being very poor, just this tiny house. The the monks' quarters venerable where we, we live, that was much bigger than the flat with my mother and father and the two kids where <laughs> where we grew up. So it's small, but at the time you felt sort of that wasn't big enough. But afterwards you feel so grateful, the fact you were cramped together with a few of your loved ones. Because it meant that, you know, you had to, I had to share a room for my whole life with my brother. And you know, he became a banker. I'm a monk, almost opposite ends. <laughs> But nevertheless, you know, we still love each other to bits because we grew up together in the same room. We could not escape from one another, even though we had different ideas about life. We had to learn about harmony and what love really is. You know, if you have your own rooms, of course you don't learn how to, how to get on with other people, how to compromise. Because you lived in the same room, you had to live in that same room, there was no escape. So you learned by necessity so many skills of how to care for one another, even though you were very different. And I also just remember my parents arguing, like all parents do argue. You get married, you can't expect not to argue. But the wonderful thing which I remember from those experiences of living in this very small house, once my parents argued, they couldn't escape either. So they were facing each other, and just, and after a while they had to just reconcile. And I always remember just my mother and father reconciling, and they couldn't hide from the kids. So my brother and I saw them forgive one another, and have a hug and say sorry. And that was one of the most delightful times. It was almost worth having the argument for so that I could see the beauty of just reconciliation and forgiveness. So you learned a lot by being unfree in a small house. <laughs> the size of the house was not what dis uh, um, not described or, or defined, the word I was looking for, defined the state of freedom there. The state of freedom was that in that house you felt happy to be there, you learned how to get on with one another. And when there was any problems, you expected those problems and you knew the answer to those problems. And that gave a wonderful sense of uh, relationship freedom. You never expected the people you live with or work with to always be doing what you really want to do or to be responsible, never to make mistakes. That's the other thing which I always remember from living in a small house, that we all made mistakes from time to time. Her mistakes were just so wonderful. <laughs> I say wonderful to celebrate mistakes rather than be ashamed of mistakes. Because it's from the mistakes you'd laugh. You crack all these silly jokes about, you know, what we did when we made mistakes. I uh, just I just trying to think of something which the mistakes we made. It was a custom over in uh UK. Oh, yeah, the custom recently of, of November, November the 5th in UK used to be what we call Guy Fawkes Night. And Guy Fawkes Night, it was a really strange custom. I know you know this because you're English. A strange custom that somehow about 400 years ago this uh, Catholic tried to blow up the Houses of Parliament. He got caught and he got executed. And so to this day, even kids not knowing anything about what happened or why, on that night of November the 5th, we just make a little doll up and we go begging for pennies and shillings or something to buy fireworks and get a, a, a nice a big bonfire and just to roast potatoes <laughs> and have a very good time. 
is Guy Fawkes night. And I remember many times just the joy of like a six or seven, eight year old kid roasting a potato or roasting some, some bread. But the potatoes were especially memorable because half of them were black, I mean, solid black, and <laughs> the other part of them were just raw. And you could just find that part of the middle, which was okay. And because you did it yourself, it was really delicious. And so all that, that fun of making mistakes made it memorable. It wasn't perfect. It wasn't meant to be perfect. It's how we learned and how we had fun and how you enjoy what's going on. And so the freedom of not having to be perfect was something which you learnt in a close family and something which sometimes we forget in a world of schools and corporations and places where we feel that we can be better than that. Is it that really the purpose of life is to excel or is it the purpose of life to be happy and to be at peace? It's a different type of freedom. The freedom to be valued for who you are and not have to make it to be perfect. The freedom to be valued even if you're disabled or disfigured and if somehow or other your genes made a mistake or doctors made a mistake or somebody made a mistake. And for those of you who have ever worked with disabled or disfigured people, sometimes you can understand just the suffering they have, always being judged because they look a little bit different than others or because they can't do what other people can do. And I sometimes remind people, look at us monks, there's so many things we can't do, so many places we can't do, I can't go into a pub. Although once I did, this was in the pub in Pinjara many years ago. There was, <laughs> I know these little stories about monks just getting into trouble. <laughs> Not real big trouble, but I was giving a talk at the Lions Club and it was in the back room of a pub, that's where they have these talks. And I thought there'd always be like a side entrance around the back, we can go around the back and say, no, there's only one way in and out to that room, through the bar. And so, so <laughs> the driver dropped me off at the entrance, because we we're not allowed to drive, at the entrance. They went off to do something, we'll pick you up later. And I was outside the pub, in my... <laughs> Thank you for laughing. In my robes, not knowing what to do next. And they said, oh, the horse in the back. And I could actually, it's a straight line. I could see it through the door down the back where that room was. I said, okay, let's go for it. <laughs> I'm very courageous. So I put my head down. I didn't look to the left, the right, and I just went for it. And I almost, almost got there, but almost like 80% of the way. And then somebody, <laughs> hand on my shoulders, pulled me round. Bram, what are you drinking? Do you want a beer? <laughs> I said, I can't, I'm a monk. <laughs> but anyway, this I like, because every time I make a mistake or do a silly event like that, I love telling people about it, simply because it does, <laughs> it does make you laugh. There's nothing to be about, you get into interesting situations sometimes. <laughs> but anyway, well, what was that story? Oh, this is another little crazy story, not about me. But this is one of uh, one of the people who were monks with Ajahn Chah many years ago. That was that gentleman called Jack Cornfield. He's just wrote, wrote quite a few books. But I remember him coming to visit uh, Thailand once and telling us one of his stories. As soon as he went back to uh, America, you know, to disrobe and just uh, to get a job. But he went to see his sister. He was still in monk's robes. So he was a, a, like a Westerner in monk's robes. And his sister said, oh, I'm, I'm doing uh, uh, like a, a beauty thing in Elizabeth Arden in New York. And it was a, the main store, you know, the flagship office. So this, this monk was actually sitting outside of Elizabeth Arden, just in the, in the, in the, uh, the chairs there, waiting for his sister to come out. But no one knew that he was waiting for his sister to come out. They just looked at him and wondered what sort of hair job or what nose job or what other sort of um, stuff he was waiting for. He said it was so embarrassing. And I could understand, <laughs> I 
understand why. What is a man, a monk, doing outside Elizabeth Arden's beauty salon? Anyway, so whenever we, <laughs> we do make mistakes like that, stupid things happen. Um, can I tell, tell? When last time I said here the story of Bunbury Beach? Was it here? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that, man. Just in brief, just in brief, in brief. Going to meditate. Bunbury Beach. Just a, it's a long beach, and it's a long way from the city. I was just sitting there quietly for two hours, meditating, enjoying the peace and quiet there. And I didn't know when I sat there. There's no one around. No one around. And afterwards, when I sort of came out of my meditation, quite a long time, two hours, I noticed. Out of my left eye, there was someone sitting next to me, and someone sitting next to me on the other side. I was um, squashed between these two people, and I looked at them, and the one on the left <laughs> was a 17-year-old blonde in a bikini, and the one on the right was uh, uh, <laughs> a dark-haired. 18, 17 year old in the beginning. I knew they were 17 year olds because they told me afterwards that I wonder what, why, what's happening? <laughs> and the only, <laughs> the only reason this was happening was it was just the day the year 12 exams had finished. And the school was just on the opposite side of the road. And of course, what do you know, kids do when the year 12 exams are finished? Yay, we're free now. So they, they all got into their bathers and were, were bathing on Bunbury Beach. And two of the girls saw me and said, oh, this is interesting. This is a, no, this man just sitting here doing nothing perfectly still. Mm -hmm. So they were waiting for me to come out of meditation to ask me about meditation and Buddhism. Perfectly honest, that's all. That's my story anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true. But if, so, if someone had seen that and taken a video or a photograph, I was just, it's so hard to live that one down. <laughs> totally innocent. But anyway, just, when mistakes like that happen, it does bring a great sense of like humor and fun to life. If mistakes never happen, our life would be very, very boring, in my view. So when things like that happen, obviously big mistakes cause a lot of problems, but you can always fix smart mistakes when they, they happen. But anyway, when things like that happen and we learn how to laugh at the failures of life, we actually learn from them rather than feeling diminished by them, then we feel so much more freedom in life. Freedom from fear of things going wrong. Freedom from fear of what people say about us or what people think about us. And you know that just how much a prison that is for many of you, worrying about what people think of you. I say this is a very quick one. That when you're in your 20s, you're very concerned what other people think of you. That's why people have to dress up when they're young and uh, say the right words. When you're in your 40s, you can't give a damn what other people think of you. You just do it anyway. And when you're in your 60s, you find out that people weren't thinking about you anyway. <laughs> if you can realize that when you're in your 20s, you know, you're, you're cool for the rest of your life. Just do it. <laughs> so, <laughs> the freedom from what other people think of you, and the freedom from, you know, just trying to live up to and please other people what they want. And you find if you get rid of those um, obstacles, those prisons of the mind, then you feel so much more freedom. You just, be who you are. But people will think, no, I'll really, I will really cause a lot of trouble to other people. And I, you know, I'm causing pain to other people. I'm disturbing other people. I'm just not helpful enough. And that's not the way the world is. Why don't you relax and just be yourself? You're a far more easy person to live with. When you're trying to prove it to somebody else, oh, you really are a pain in the butt and in many other places as well. <laughs> but when you just relax and just be who you are, I, I mentioned this to <laughs> my monastic talk a couple of days ago, 
that I looked at all the monks in Bodhinyana Monastery and said they're all eccentric. There's no normal one there at all. <laughs> yeah, come on, yeah. In other words, there's no such thing as a perfect monk. And it's, I, the nuns were there as well, and I said, anyone in the nuns monastery Dhammasara perfect? And nope, they're all eccentric too. <laughs> In other words, why are we trying to live up to something which we can never be? Instead, we accept each other for who we are. We give each other freedom to be, instead of trying to force them to be in a certain way. Have you ever had a relationship like that with somebody who just loves you for who you are and doesn't force you into some sort of what they want to be? One person <laughs> who you may recognize is just loves you and doesn't force you to be anything is your your grandma or your grandpa. Have you ever noticed your grandparents they just they just love to feed you they just love to care for you they just don't really worry about how fat you are they'll still give you some chips if you want some chips. That's my grandma. I loved her for that. <laughs> this was when I was growing up. I would just go to her apartment and she said, Do you want some chips? I said, Oh, yeah. <laughs> About three o'clock, four o'clock in the afternoon, she'd get out a potato, slice it up, and just do all of it and just fry them for me. That's it, nothing else. When my mother found out, oh, my mother would just really scold my grandma. You can't do that to my son. He said, Yes, I can. <laughs> if he wants chips, he gets chips. <laughs> You know, and I never abused that. I was actually thin at that time. But I loved, just that was her way of expressing her, her kindness towards me. And that was my way of saying, yes, I, I value that, thank you. It, sometimes you feel, if you trust people, which is like giving a person freedom, then they usually live up to it. They don't usually let you down. That's my experience anyway. You trust, well, look at, well, Philip Metiji knows this, we don't know what we're going to eat tomorrow. We don't know if anybody's come, going to come to feed us. These days, it's like way too much. But in those early days, sometimes you didn't know if someone was going to come and feed us, but they always did. They looked after us and cared for us. Because that trust which you give to other people, so here we are, we're sort of monks who don't have any money, monks who we, we're not allowed to cook, we're not allowed to store food. So here we are, feed us. <laughs> it's a great joy doing things like that. And for, for you, you know, if there's anything you know, that which you require, then yeah, we can talk to you and help you whichever way we can, whatever resources we have. You know, the monks, the nuns, they look after you. In whatever way we can. So we trust each other. When you trust one another, look at... I know that, is Dennis still around? Has he gone back? Oh, he's yeah. <laughs> Dennis was actually asking, uh, just, oh, there's always more stuff to do to raise money for this or raise money. But, but it's, honestly, Dennis, there's enough money in the kitty. You're going to argue with me afterwards. There's enough there. There's enough money in the monasteries. And the point is, uh, where did all that come from? Sometimes I look and say, wow, how did that happen? People are so kind. So, if ever we need something, people will always be there to, to help. So it's a lot of freedom from worry. A lot of times people think they do need a whole heap of stuff just in case. Just in case of what? <laughs> just, in, just in case of <laughs> somebody, I don't know. But a lot of times, uh, if there is a need, the things will come at the right time, the right place. And of course, that's, that has happened in the whole history of our Buddhist society of West Australia. Oh, there's so many times, not just once, but many times, we said, oh, let's just do it. Oh, there's not enough money in the bank. Oh, let's do it anyway. And just we do and get some loans, go in debt. And it always works out. Always. Why is that? Because people are really kind. And you know, we don't sort of ask, we just open ourselves up. 
So that freedom, when you don't worry about anything, and if it doesn't work out, fine, just, we can always do something else. Little by little, when we give away a lot of our fears and demands, and have some trust. For a good example of that, there was one of the monks, many years ago, he was coming back from overseas in a time when we did have travel. I think it was only from um, Tasmania or from maybe from New Zealand. And he told my said, when you come in, we we'll arrange a car to pick you up. And he said, no. He said, I'm not going to tell you when I'm arriving. He said, why not? He said, I want to try, out, try it out. Just arrive at Perth Airport on an international flight and start walking. You know, from Perth Airport to Serpentine, just to see what happens. <laughs> and of course what happened was he only got about 50 meters outside the airport when someone stopped and said, oh, you're a monk, where are you going? Go to monastery, I can give you a lift. <laughs> and he got a lift all the way to the monastery. Some people are like that, they can trust. And for the people I've seen in my life, the people who have that degree of trust and their goodness, it's amazing what happens to them, how great things occur for them. A great freedom from worry. So I don't know what you're worried about in our life. Worried about COVID? Well, if you get COVID. COVID is wonderful if you get it. I want to get COVID so I can flatten my curve. <laughs> no. But you know, sometimes things are unpleasant, but yeah, it doesn't it doesn't last. How I was taught so that if you ever get sick and you get worried about sickness, that time when my teacher came to see me when I was really sick with typhus fever. I was just really just emaciated and just so weak. And when you have this really wonderful person who's just so famous in Thailand at that time, they come and see you, see me in the hospital. Oh, it was so wonderful. You're getting a visit from my hero. And I was just so uplifted for about one second until he said his bedside manner was just really needed to be upgraded, I reckon. Because he said to me, Bumble Wong, sir, that's not a full name, you'll either get better or you'll die. <laughs> and then he turned around and went. <laughs> the worst part of that, you can't argue with that, can you? That's totally true if you're sick enough. But to please, if you're going to go and visit your mother this afternoon or this evening or tomorrow in hospital, please don't do that to her. <laughs> Hi, Mum. <laughs> you're either going to get better or die and then you'll leave. That's, <laughs> that's not going to work. But anyway, the simplicity there was wonderful. But even if you are sick, the freedom. Can you be free from sickness? Of course not. We all get sick sooner or later. To be free from sickness, the freedom from that physical ailment is often gained when you understand that little way which I've been teaching for a long time now is whenever you do get sick, please never think there's something wrong that you're sick. When you go to see your doctor, <laughs> please don't say, doctor, there's something wrong with me, I'm sick again. Don't do that. When you go to your doctor, tell your doctor, doctor, there's something right with me. I'm sick again. Because sickness <laughs> is nothing wrong with it. It's part of life. It's just the way the body reacts to dealing with sort of bugs or um, injuries or old age or whatever else which happens in your body. But imagine you start to say that, Doctor, there's something right with me. I'm sick again. It takes away the, the, in, the indignity, the degradation, the shame of like being sick. And you know where I learned that? I used to go and teach in prisons, especially the prison down at Carnet Prison Farm, not far from our monastery. And at once when I felt really sick and I went to see the doctor, I don't know what it was, probably a flu or something, many years ago, and there you were, marking my robes, sitting in the doctor's surgery, and I felt really terrible. And then this uh, prison officer, you know, I knew from the prison at Carnet, came in, he took one look at me and said, I never expected to see you in here. I felt so sort of guilty and ashamed. It's like I'd been caught in a pub or a, a place of uh, <laughs> prostitution or something, I don't know. 
Aren't monks allowed to be sick, please? <laughs> but he thought that meditation makes you always healthy, and that's why he sort of was... And I said, what's wrong with being sick? Because if you uh, feel ashamed of being sick, that means a lot of time you hide your symptoms. You don't want to admit that your body is just playing up. So, to be free from sickness is to embrace sickness, allow it to be. And, and a lot of times if you embrace it, not afraid of it, sometimes those sicknesses disappear by themselves. It's the attitude you have to coughs and fevers, that is sometimes how we become free of them. We get worried about them, of course they get worse. Sometimes allowing them to be. What was that time? Quite a few times, because I must suffer from some allergies. I remember having a really, really bad cold when I was still a student. And the cold was so bad, there's no way I could go to the classes in the morning. So I was just laying in bed, all my friends in this house which we'd rented together, they'd all gone off to the university and I was laying in bed feeling terrible. I hope I didn't tell this story last time. But anyway, I felt really terrible and there was a knock came on the door of the house and no one else was there, they'd all were at the university and I had to just stagger up, stagger up, still in pyjamas, just to stumble to the door and open the door, what do you want? And it was a parcel for me. And the parcel contained, for those of you my age, the stereo system, hi-fi system, which I'd sent from London to where I was staying. And I was really excited. In those days, to actually to listen to music, and you had to have an amplifier, a, a, a deck to play, and, and um, mi not microphones, loudspeakers. I had the records already, the LPs, but I didn't have anything to play it on. Now I did. And it took me about half an hour, an hour to connect it all together and put on my first record, my first disc, which was Jimi Hendrix. For those of you who know that fellow, I was really into rock music when I was young. And that incredible thing happened. And this is no, no exaggeration. As soon as I put that on, I noticed my cold had totally gone. It's a great way to cure COVID. Listen. <laughs> Jimmy Hendrix. Or whatever else you like. For me, I was so excited, so enjoyed just listening to something which I hadn't listened to for a couple of weeks. And that was, gave me so much happiness and joy that that overcame just the physical problems of that, that disease. I've seen that too many times. Sometimes joy and happiness. Remember that Patch Adams who make people laugh by dressing up in a tutu and doing dancing in front of people dying of cancer? And you know, the cancer would get less and sometimes get cured. So you understand the happiness, the way we react to sickness. That has an important... A uh, part of like healing. So if you want to be free of sickness, enjoy it. How can you do that? Oh. See, it's a positive side. There was this <laughs> one guy in our Armadale group, he knew he was really chronically depressed. And he came to see me for some counseling. And I told him, I said, Wow, it's amazing. You're chronically depressed? And yeah, for about three or four weeks. I said, Great. Once you start to feel better, don't tell your wife. Because enjoy your depression. Number one, you don't have to go to work. He said, yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Number two, you can, you can eat whatever you want. You know, they don't really worry about, you know, this is bad for you. I said, that's really true. My daughter came this morning, gave me some ice cream. I really like that ice cream. I had double helpings. She said, if you get better, you won't be able to get that anymore. <laughs> I had this guy laughing after a few minutes and of course that really got him out of his depression. You understand what's happening here? That sometimes we lock ourselves in prisons. If you fight that illness and get ashamed about it, negative towards it, you are, you've made a prison for yourself. To be free, 
you may not be able to get rid of the, the fever or the pain, but you can get rid of the way you react to it. And that lets you understand just how just freedom actually works. Freedom is not something physical. Freedom is not just being outside of the prison, because I've seen many people just, oh, there's this one gentleman some years ago, he was a Buddhist, but he was put in jail for something he never did for I don't know how many years. And he came over here for quite a few Fridays and meditation after he was released, but people recognized him. And he, he felt ashamed, even though he was totally innocent. And so he actually went back to UK where he could be anonymous. Freedom was not just being free from the jail. Freedom was like the emotional freedom which wasn't there for him. So the freedom from the emotional freedom, which is a paramount freedom, and then even in a prison you can feel free. In a monastery you can feel free, on a retreat you can feel free. And understanding how you can feel free in those places, if ever you do have to go in quarantine. Three monks, our monks are in quarantine now, they just came over from Melbourne. And they're having a wonderful time, so I've heard. Having a wonderful time, it's just like being on a retreat. Yay! If you're on quarantine, sometimes I've read articles that people's mental health gets challenged when they're in quarantine. Why on earth? People always tell me they haven't got enough time in our world. There's just so many things they'd love to do, but they just can't fit it into their schedule. If you're in quarantine, you've got all this time, two weeks of freedom. But do people feel that being stuck in a hotel is two weeks of freedom? Or do instead they feel it's two weeks of being in a prison? What's the difference? It's not the room you're in, it's just the attitude which you have to it. So much of the time when we talk about freedom, it's nothing to do with the physical situation. Very much to do to the attitude which we have to our life. And how we can find freedom in the most unlikely situations. So it's the same that to find that freedom when what the underlying cause of freedom is. Is what I, I meant to say much more about this earlier. It's like the two types of freedom in the world. And this is what you know he got from uh, learning from great teachers and understanding meditation. The two types of freedom in this world are the freedom of desire. And that's what we celebrate in our Western culture. So whatever you want, as long as it doesn't harm other people, you can have, you deserve. To have enough money, enough freedoms, so if you want to see a movie, you want to see a, uh, some music, you can get out your iPods, or no, that's old, isn't it, iPods? Get out your iPhones and just listen or see whatever you want, wherever you want. Nowadays, because you can't go to where you want, again, that's why people are struggling with their mental health. In the old days, you can just go off to Sydney to see your family for Christmas. You can go overseas to reunite with some of your families in different countries. When your loved one, part of your family, dies in another country, that's happened so often in the past few weeks. Somebody's partner dies and they're in Thailand or their mother dies and they just can't go to see them for the funerals. And that causes so much problems and troubles. Please excuse me, but you can change attitudes. Instead, the freedom of having time, the freedom of finding alternatives, to always having to go overseas to visit a person. I always thought I'd be free and have so much more time during this COVID period. But the main reason I wasn't here last week was because I was doing a Zoom retreat for people in the UK. So I was, <laughs> you know the retreats we do here, the nine day retreats? This was a six day retreat for uh, Aya Chandra's um, monastery over in the UK. So that's you know, so much talks, especially in the afternoon or evening. I just I couldn't make it to come to to Nonamara Centre for the evening. So I always thought I'd be so free when you couldn't travel, but no, there's other ways of travelling. 
Zoom and Skype. <laughs> and the most important things were just the teachings. And that was actually something which many people notice in the comments afterwards. And as the talking with people just online afterwards, was that even though that you know, I was sitting in Bodhinyana Monastery in my office and people were listening in the UK, still, because we were connecting together by teaching and teaching and teaching and teaching, like even you, uh, Nicholas, he also participated in that for me. <laughs> but even so, there was a case that it was almost as good, if not better, than actually being face to face. Sometimes the idea you have to be sitting in front of somebody to actually to communicate at some of the most deepest of levels. You know, to express your love, your forgiveness, and your uh, respect, a, a relation has passed away. You don't need to do the traveling. I like to challenge people's assumptions. You can do that at a distance, if you know how to use your heart and your mind and to stay long enough to allow that conveyance of what you convey sitting in front of a person would also do. So anyway, you've got the, the freedom of desire, so you can do whatever you want whenever you want to. But the other type of freedom, which I always celebrate much more, is called the freedom from desire. So those wantings, those desires, those ill wills, those criticisms, those complaints don't come up anyway. You know, we, sometimes, we haven't done this yet at this centre, but sometimes you even thought that one day, one day instead of having a donation box in the back, we could have a complaints box. Is that a good idea, Bill? A complaints <laughs> box? <laughs> he says no. <laughs> I think we did that once. <laughs> we got it for him just a couple of minutes. But instead of encouraging complaints, encouraging sort of something else. The people you live with, the people you work with, you know, even yourself, do you complain about yourself? Oh, I'm not good enough. Oh, I should have done that better. Oh, why did I say that? I shouldn't have done that. Why did he do that? Why did she do that? Sometimes the complaints create more desires more things to fix up. Freedom from business. No business to do. Nothing you want. It even happened to me today. Somebody, a very nice, kind woman, came up and said, "Just, I really want to get you something. Do you want a book? Any book. What book do you want? I'll buy you a book. So let me know what book you want. And I was, I was really trying to think of what book I would like, and I couldn't. I said, actually, I don't want a book. I said, anything else? And no, actually, I don't want anything. It's wonderful when you have freedom from desires. That's why if anybody is coming to Christmas time, Christmas time you usually give gifts to people. So if any of you want to give me a gift for Christmas, <laughs> Then get a nice little box and get some nice wrapping paper and then you can offer it to me at Christmas. But make sure, please make sure there's nothing in the box. Give the wonderful gift of nothing, of freedom. Because the trouble is if you give me something then I've got to, I don't need it, so I've got to give it away to somebody, I've got to find someone else who needs it. So give the wonderful gift freedom. Or even better, if you, if you want to give someone a gift, maybe you know, somebody you really care for, just, you know, just write inside that box, L-O-V-E, love. Just something simple. And then give that you know, to your mum for Christmas. Or whatever. You know sometimes that I've done that to myself in my meditation, I've done a visual, ex visual exercise, just an imagination exercise. So, if, you know, if you want to start meditation and the ordinary meditation is not working today or something, and you just, you know, what should I do? You always innovate. Be free to do things differently. 
So sometimes I would imagine, I would imagine that I'm a bit tired, so I need some energy. So I'd imagine, imagine finding a box, just visualize it, finding a box, small box, and some wrapping paper, and some nice ribbon, and a little gift card. And I put in that box, energy. Put lots and lots of energy in that box. I'd imagine energy going in the box. And I'd put the lid on, I'd wrap it up, in my mind, a nice ribbon, a nice bow on it, really do it nicely, and a nice card, and I'd write on the dedication to me, with love, from me. And I'd imagine just putting it aside somewhere. And then imagine just, you know, just going about your business, and then, oh, there's a box there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a present in there. Who is it? It's, no, it's, it's to me. <laughs> you sent it. Oh, I did. Oh, isn't that wonderful? <laughs> and then I'd open it. I wouldn't tear it apart. Just open it very slowly. And when I opened it, I'd open it. Ah, energy. Thank you so much. <laughs> Those exercises actually work. They work because sometimes, just to say be kind to yourself, or just give yourself some, some time, Put time in there, T-I-M-E, or one hour or something, just for you, for nobody else. So you can relax and have some space in your life, some time in your life. And give yourself the gift of time for Christmas. <laughs> there's also New Year's another time, then there's Chinese New Year, and then there's Thai New Year, and there's birthdays. There's so many times you can give yourself gifts. But beautiful gifts. And when you receive them, please receive them allow them to come into your heart. And then you find peace. So it's a piece of freedom from wanting the beautiful things in life. What do you really want in life? It's just some peace, happiness, respect, kindness. And if no one else will give it to you, you can always give it to yourself. Just a couple of days ago, yeah, it was on yeah, Thursday morning, yeah, yesterday, crikey, that I did a little interview for someone who's writing a book on, on solitude and and why people are afraid of just by being alone. And I gave them an exercise because they, I said, the reason why people are afraid of being alone is because they, they lack sufficient self-love. And they said, well, give us an example on how we can improve our kindness to ourselves." So because this was on Zoom, there's was someone over in Melbourne who's an Iranian girl, very nice lady. And anyway, one thing I noticed on that interview, it was only about 20 minutes, but her face, when I first started the interview, was very taut, very tight. But at the end of it, she was laughing all over her face. I thought, wow, I've obviously got some kindness and some joy, relaxation in there, which is wonderful. But anyway, I told her that if ever you're living alone, or ever you're alone, or ever you're at work and you're having a very difficult day, or you're in a hospital and it's just so tough for you, that... What you really need is a hug. Unfortunately, in today's world, we're not allowed to hug each other. I'm not allowed to hug you, otherwise I'll get put in jail for sexual abuse. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know what. But anyway, and we can't hug each other now anyway because we don't know what disease we might catch. So because of that, I <laughs> invented, I think it's a event, I've never seen anyone else do this. I invented doing your own hug. And it's a nice way to end this talk for today. So please follow me. Yeah, come on, put your hands out, those who want to join in. And draw your hands in. <laughs> and really get into it. It actually feels good. <laughs> and I can't sue myself for sexual assault. <laughs> and I can't catch anything I don't already have. <laughs> so it's perfectly safe. And it actually, <laughs> it actually feels good. So I told her that little trick. When you're alone in solitude or whatever, give yourself a hug. If no one else would. And it actually works. Little ways we can feel some freedom. Freedom from the things which oppress you. So if somebody says, please give me a hug. 
If it's you who says that, then give yourself a hug. Thank you for listening. <laughs> okay, very good. Oh, come on, that's not much of a sadhu. Come give it some energy. One, two, three. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay, thank you. So, is there some questions for tonight? Hey. Very good. Excellent. See what we've got here. Okay. Oh. From Handy Hero One. I want to ask Ajahn Brahm, please, what is the difference between silence and mindfulness? It's mindfulness is just being aware, but silence enhances the mindfulness, it makes it stronger. More focused mindfulness, then you become silent. Because to really be aware of what life is teaching and its miracle of life, if you're talking back to life, you're not really listening to the lesson. If you're silence, then you're really listening. Ajahn Brahm, I'm not sure if I'm experiencing nibbida, dispassion or dep depression. I'm 40 and I have no interest in anything. Please advise. You do have interest in sending emails to me, so that's something. So your interest is in some things, but not in other things. So find out the things which like inspire you. And if you have no, you know, feel really depressed, again, try that little trick of imagining a box. And what you think you're missing out in life, put it in the box. Even if it's just a word, even if it's a letter, or something which will inspire you. And send it to yourself for Christmas. If that doesn't work, Try giving yourself a hug. Anyway, it's de dispassion or depression. If a person is developing their mind and becoming closer and closer to enlightenment, it's not that you feel depressed or that you don't sort of have any interest in things. Your interest is in serving and in creating more happiness in this life, in this world. When the negative emotions disappear, the positive emotions get stronger. So there's positive emotions, so joy gets very, very strong. And the loss. Oh, a wolfram from Germany. How do you find freedom with chronic pain and anxiety? How do you find freedom when you're out of balance? Uh, if you're out of balance, sometimes be out of balance. In other words, you have to be in a safe place if you're out of balance. Sometimes uh, I'm out of balance. So pop yourself up, make sure you don't sort of hurt yourself. But don't try and be something different than you are. And even with chronic pain, there's two types of, two types of that pain, which the Buddha always used to talk about. The mental part, the emotional part, sorry. The emotional response and the physical response. The physical response we can't do much about, that's for doctors. But the emotional response, that we can do a huge amount with. With chronic pain, one of the important things to do, if it's at all possible for you, is to be in the present moment. Really focus in the now, because you have to. Because a lot of the, the suffering of chronic pain is worrying about how long this is going to go on for. I can't take this any longer. That my endur endurance is at its limit. Which is always allowing the mind just to think about the future. You're enjoying it now, you're alive now, it's happening. See if you can change your perception to the experience of now. And don't even worry about the future. And don't assume because it's you know, been there for such a long time already, it's going to be there for a long time in the future. Sometimes, and I've experienced this really quite a lot of pain disappearing in a moment. It's weird how this body and mind work. Sometimes that happens. So, when chronic pain and anxiety, the anxiety about worrying about what's going to happen in the future. You don't know what's going to happen in the future. That's one of the nice things about uh, Buddhism. You can just, you, you'll be able to adapt in one way or another. I've known people who have had really chronic pain and there's one gentleman who had chronic pain. Oh, he was the one who used to get into such deep meditations. And he was one of the most, uh, I think it was about five or six people in Western Australia at the time, 
who were, he told me, and I don't doubt him, legally allowed to have any medication, any drug, even illegal drugs, he was allowed at the time because his pain was so in intense. And you could actually see it on the CT scan. Uh, Andros, I've learned my five-month-old daughter has significant disabilities. Each day with her there is love, yet at the same time immense feeling of sorrow, pain and anxiety. What can I do? If you have sorrow, pain and anxiety, your five-month-old daughter will start to feel that herself and feel that there's something wrong with her. So disabilities, even the name disabilities, it's just call it difference. I'm not quite sure what the disabilities are, but the differences are. But if we can somehow embrace those differences and not to feel that there's something which has to be changed and that you could love your, your daughter you know, for the rest of her life as she is and that she's a gift to you to expand your ability to love and your understanding of how to respect one another. Every now and again somebody sends me these amazing videos of people who have children who are not the same as other people's children. In this one video I saw with this dad who had an autistic son and used to take his autistic son on marathons on his back and you could see just, you know, I don't think I was making it up or just imagining it on the son's face. There's just the joy of competing with his dad, the dad carrying on his back, these really long marathons. And he was just doing things in a different way. And so, you know, the autism was very, uh, very strong. But the dad said, Look, I love my son. And of course I'll go on these marathons with him. It's wonderful, inspiring, what you can do. Well, from Saraya Wirasinghe, Dear Ajahn Brahm, what other Buddhist practices that help stay focused at school? How to remember the facts we learned at school and use them in exams? Thanks. That's a good question, and I did very well at school when I was a student. I often wondered why. And because you know, I had some understanding of simple mindfulness, even when I was at school, I would listen to the teacher without thinking. So when the teacher was giving a lesson, I was quiet inside. So I could actually soak in whatever the teacher said. And also I could remember it. And later on when I was say, uh, a student at university, I knew how to do exams because I would relax before the exams. I mean, I knew how to relax my body, how to relax my mind. So that when you went into the exam, your brain was working at full potential. Instead of working with a brain which had learnt all the, the stuff which you're supposed to learn, but was so tight because of worry and anxiety or because of working too hard, it couldn't perform. So that's one of the reasons I... You know, so many years ago, uh, five or six years ago, I was invited over to Carmel School, the Jewish school here in Perth, actually just before the year 12's exams, to give them some advice. So because one of the, the rabbis there, Moshe Bernstein, he was a nice friend of mine, said, yeah, come to our school and teach us how to, to do well in the year 12's. And they got the top school that year. And the, the principal sent me a nice letter saying, thank you, Ajahn Brahm, for helping our kids become the top school in the year 12's that year. And that's how you do it. Just before the exam, relax to the max. And don't pick up any of your textbooks the, day, the night before the exam you're going to sit. Just you know, watch a movie, listen to some nice music, have a good sleep. Tell, them, tell your parents to get your favourite foods that, that day so you can have some energy and fun inside of you. And lastly, what is your thought about full enlightenment in other religions? Full enlightenment you don't think about. It's the absence of thought. So what is your thought about full enlightenment in other religions? No thought at all. <laughs> and other religions? What are other religions? Other names? Maybe other sort of paths. But this is what... I have to quote the Buddha here. Because just before the Buddha passed away, they, somebody came up to him and said, can you become enlightened in different religions? 
actually asked him that question. And the Buddha replied, just in brief, says, wherever you can practice the Eightfold Path, you'll find enlightened people. It's not the name of the religion, it's not the belief system, but it's what you do. And if you practice Eightfold Path, then that's, you'll become enlightened, that's it. It doesn't matter if you're a man, woman, if you're disabled, if you're LGBTQIA+, plus, whatever, it is just if you practice the Oakfold Path, then that's what happens. You become enlightened. So I, I love that answer because it, it cuts to the chase. It doesn't matter what your books you read and just what robes you wear or what gender you are or what age or what... It's just what you do. If you let go of desire, you become free. Okay, there we go. So thanks again for listening. Any questions from people here? Because also, always, you know, from Mr. iPad or whatever it's called. Anyone for, for real people? No? You know, for those people who haven't been here before, I ask any questions and people, no one says anything. As soon as we finish, there's a whole line of people here <laughs> to ask questions. Such is life. <laughs> yes. Okay. So anyway, now we can pay respects to Buddha Dhamma Sangha and then we can go do what we need to do. Pati Pano Bhagavato Sawaka Sango Sangan Namami <laughs> Very good. Oh. And for those of you who wonder why we bow, that's to exercise our tummy muscles so we don't put on too much weight. <laughs> Didn't work for me though. <laughs>